Everybody put three fingers in the air. The sky is falling, the wind is calling, stand for something or die in the morning. Section 80, high power. The Honorable Brother Elijah Muhammad teaches uh, us that our own mind has to be changed. We have to change our uh, mind about ourselves. In what way? Well, so he uh, teaches us the importance of moral reformation, uh, a knowledge of self. And uh, for instance, the average so-called Negro, he doesn't think that he can uh, go into business and provide jobs for himself. And because of this, he thinks that he can only get a job from the white man, or he can only get clothes from the white man, or he can only get food from the white man. And we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad are taught that uh, the same thing that the white man has done for himself and his kind, uh, if our people could uh, be uh, wrecked, if, they could, if we could be cured of our slave mentality that was uh, indoctrinated into us during slavery, we would realize that just as the white man can do these things for himself and his kind, we can get together in unity and harmony and do the same thing for ourselves and our kind. Greetings and welcome back to the Woke Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Jones, and it has been a really good couple of weeks for the Woke Podcast. Big announcement. Many of you may have noticed if you're already subscribed, if this is your first time listening, Woke Podcast is now officially a part of the Smart Brown Voices Network. Big shout outs to Mike Street and everything that he's done with Smart Brown Voices Podcast, and now he's launching his own network and I have been um, chosen, I can say chosen, uh, to come onto the network and share some of my content and share some of my perspective and what we're doing over here at the Woke Podcast. So we are now officially a part of Smart Brown Voices Network and it's a big move, very big thing. Um, We're very early on in the process with Woke Podcast. Uh, we, We have a couple of episodes loaded and ready to go. And uh, just a few episodes out, and it's pretty big to already be picked up by someone who's been doing this and making huge strides as it comes to uh, podcasters, more spe- more specifically, black podcasts, and being named, you know, one of the top 10 uh, black business podcasts or black podcasts that fo- focuses on entrepreneurship, as in Smart Brown Voices. So I'm honored to uh, be affiliated with the network, and hopefully, you know, one day I'll be a part of that top 10 uh, podcast uh, as it pertains to black folks or just podcasts in general. So I hope to keep bringing constructive and useful content uh, by way of woke podcast. And hopefully we will continue to develop and grow with the smart brown voices network. So big, big, big shout outs to Mike street on that and to keep it pushing. I hope people have appreciated and hope people have um, shared and actually learned a few things from the past few episodes that we've had, um, you know, the last two episodes were with Mr. Sam Simmons as he broke down historical and intergenerational trauma and told a little bit about his story. And uh, and it is very important for us to do that. And it's been a crazy, crazy, crazy um, year, 2016 for black people. I mean, every year is kind of crazy for us, but this year has just been a little different as far as. Um, hmm, how do I term this? Social consciousness. <laughs> I don't really like that term. Um, I think that's a good way for most people to kind of understand what I mean as far as us just being aware. You know, currently we have the whole um, you know National Football League players, the NFL players, taking knees um, or sitting out of the national anthem, and that's been huge. We're you know we're at this moment where pretty soon here we're going to be electing the new president. So people are focusing on those issues. We've had several um, black celebrities, well-noted people die this year. Um, it's been a very interesting time. Uh, and then we've also had some very highly profiled uh, executions of black people um, this year as well. So, you know, it's we're at an interesting point in time in history and at an interesting point in time in um, in our own present time and present lives. And, and we have to be woke, right? This whole notion of woke, we have to be focused on, um, you know, who we are, where we are and what we are trying to accomplish. And that, and that's the goal of this podcast. That's one of the goals of this podcast is to make sure that, you know, I am being an objective and constructive voice 
to help us uh, move forward. I'm not here to be an authority on too many things or on you or on us as black people, but I am here to add a perspective and hopefully some influence to kind of critically think and uh, constructively act on things. So, you know, that that's why I've been doing this and, and, and that's why I will continue to do this. And, you know, this past week has just been a very interesting week for me. Um, you know, outside of all this stuff that's going on nationally and things that are getting a lot of social media uh, attention, uh, just for myself, you know, being a therapist and working with clients, I've had some uh, very challenging <laughs> clients this week. Uh, the school year has just started and people are coming back and I'm, you know, I'm hearing stories from what has happened over the summer at the, you know, you lose touch when I work in a school based setting. So um, as students are gone, they really are not trying to come back to their school to receive therapy. So I didn't have too many clients at the schools this summer and hearing this, the stories of what's happening and, um, you know, people being people being kicked out of their homes, people running away. Uh, people's parents passing away. Uh, it's, it's been a very traumatic year overall, I think, for a lot of people. And then also getting a lot of new students to come see me for therapy and hearing some of their issues that are going on. It had me questioning this whole concept of culture and what is black culture. And that's what today's podcast is on. What is black culture? So what is culture? You know, culture is something that gets thrown around a lot. The term, the word is thrown a lot around a lot um, in all settings, uh, especially in workplaces. But in general, what is culture? You know, some people say hip hop's a culture. Some people say black people have a culture. We have American culture. We have Western culture. We have Afrocentric culture. We have conscious culture, all these different things. But what really are we talking about? And a lot of times I ask myself the question is what what is black culture? Because, you know, I, I've all I've, I've seen it. I've heard it. You know, black people are not monolithical. Right. We don't all subscribe to the same things. And, th and I believe that that's true. However, we do have some serious commonalities amongst us, no matter you know what our social economic status is, where we come from, um, you know, how we how we grew up in our families um, you know, how much income we have and all these other things. I think that there are some very core things that no matter, you know, what your circumstances were, you will share just based on the fact that you are classified as a black person. Um, one of my quotes that I often say is that culture is the main educator. I'm going to say that again. Culture is the main educator. Now, what do I mean by culture is the main educator? Culture gives you the education that you need. Culture, I believe culture is based off of um, several different things that are linked to our survival. And which I also believe that, you know, our culture as black people needs to be um, altered for us to change this, the condition that we have overall within the world. I think that we definitely need to alter our culture. There's some things that are very constructive that we need to build on. And there are some things that are very destructive collectively that we need to uh, find ways to get rid of. And it's easier said than done. Uh, I absolutely want to be honest about that. It's very easily, easier to be said than done. Um, you know, but I've come to the conclusion that change is a process of altering our habits and um, our behaviors. That, you know, if you want change to happen, you have to alter your habits and your behaviors. And uh, absolutely that, you know, that has something to do with your mindset. You have to alter your mindset as well. But at the end of the day, if you're not changing your habits, if you're not changing your behaviors, nothing else is changing in your life. So, you know, change is something that is often part of any solution. You know, you know, shifting what you're doing is a part of any solution that you're trying to come up with. Um, um, however, I found that, you know, change is something that is not defined very clearly most times. You know, we hear we hear the slogans, we hear the um, we see the hashtags and everything that impl implement what is change. We need change, you know, um, you know, change is going to come and these things. But we never really define clearly what what the heck what are we talking about? Are we just saying this because it sounds good? Yeah, everybody's down with, you know, we need some changes and changes, you know, we got to overcome so we can change. But what are we actually trying to change? Like we have to have that conclusion, that peace 
there so we know that we're not just throwing out these slogans and just moving forward. So, um, you know, what does my, my question that I often ask people and I ask people this on a on a collective level or on an individual level, like say if I'm working with a client and they tell me they want to make some changes and I ask them, well, what does change look like for you? What does change look like for you? What does that look like? Uh, that's a good question to ask people whenever they're, you know, saying things, these blanket statements. And, we, you know, we, it's really confusing because it sounds good when you say it, but it really doesn't mean anything is what does that look like to you? So what does change look like to you? That's a question that you can ask for yourself. Um, you know, I have concluded that cultures must pivot in order to see the desired outcome that you want. And I think that people must pivot to also, um, you know, to also receive the desired outcome that they want as well. You know, one of my biggest influencers is someone by the name of Dr. Amos Wilson. And you're going to hear me refer to Dr. Amos Wilson a lot. A lot of black people do not have a clue who Dr. Amos Wilson is, which is very interesting to me because uh, Dr. Amos Wilson is probably one of the most important black men uh, that we've ever had in the United States of America. And he doesn't get talked about a lot. And I think that's why, um, because he, I think the materials that he's put out, the lectures that he's done, and you can see many of those lectures on YouTube, the books that he's written, all of the books are excellent, well doc documented, scholarly, um, and really get down to the the roots of what's going on and how to change a lot of what's happening for black people. And he was doing this in the 80s and then the 90s. And unfortunately, he died in 95. But, um, you know, it's very important for us to be very familiar with Dr. Amos Wilson. I mean, this guy is phenomenal, phenomenal. And what Dr. Wil Amos Wilson says is culture is a set of rules and procedures to meet the needs and solve problems of people. That's how he defined culture, a set of rules and procedures to meet the needs and solve problems of people. And he, and, he, and he used various different ethnic groups and social groups and talked about their culture on how it's utilized to meet the needs and solve the problems of those people. And I agree with his definition. Um, and I've actually expanded on it. And this is how I define culture. I say that culture is a set of behaviors, beliefs, concepts, linguistics, experiences, and expectations which are subscribed to a social collective to meet the agreed upon wants and needs. And here's what I mean by that. When I say that it's a set of um, behaviors, beliefs, concepts, linguistics, experiences, and expectations that are subscribed to by a social collective, I'm talking about people. It could be a place. It could also be things, right? So people, places, and things to meet a agreed upon wants and needs. And this can be uh, directly agreed upon or indirectly agreed upon. So let's think about black people with this definition that I have. Let's think about how black people um, have a set of behaviors, beliefs, concept, li linguistics, um, or language uh, expect expectations and experiences. So as black people, you know, we have a set of behaviors. There's things that we do that kind of are different than other people. Now, granted, there's a lot of overlap because we are human beings, right? But there are certain behaviors that we do um, that are, you know, I don't want to say mutually exclusive to us, but we just kind of do these things. You know, we have certain vibes about us. Um, you know, we have that certain look. We have certain ways that we prepare things. We have certain ways that um, that we behave and that we look out for our collectives. And that's just kind of how we operate. And, and for the most part, I'm speaking of African-American people. Um, and then we have certain beliefs, uh, whether those are religious beliefs, social beliefs, um, beliefs about ourselves, um, and then those concepts too. Um, we have certain concepts on how we get down. <laughs> we have certain concepts on how we understand the world and our worldview is different than a lot of other people's based on our condition and our experiences, right? So our experiences are different as well, um, which leads to our expectations, you know, one of the things that's happening right now uh, is this whole notion of all lives matter, blue lives matter versus black lives matter. And, you know, what the expectations are of all of that is confusing a lot of people. One of the things that I try to steer myself away from is having conversations about racism with white people. 
um i i I, unfortunately, I live in the state of Minnesota, (laughs) so it's hard for me to avoid having these conversations, but I try not to most of the time because my expectations as a black male, as a younger black male, as a millennial black male is very different from a lot of my counterparts um, expectations. So if I'm talking about my experience as a black male and I'm talking to someone who's not black you know, their expectations are way different. And when we're talking about power differentials in dominant society and we're talking about, you know, black people talking to white folks, you know, their expectations is that we're just, we're, we need to fall in line and assimilate. And my expectations might be different when I'm talking about empowering myself um, and having a little bit more, uh, you know, interdependence versus being completely dependent on some other group. So oftentimes, you know, our expectations are completely different based on our worldview and our in our, our beliefs and concepts and things like that. And also you have different expectations within our collective too. Um, you know, we have, especially for black people due to our, you know, traumatized conditioning and our, we've been socially engineered under, you know, disenfranchisement, and terror, and, you know, a lot of negative traumatic things, you know, we are a scattered collective. So our expectations are all different. You know, we have people who feel like we need to just pray on things and allow our spiritual um, beliefs to handle things. We have people that, you know, say that they want to take arms against other people. And then we have people who, you know, just want to go along and get along. And then you have people who are, you know, trying to find creative solutions as well. So, you know, even within our collective, we have a lot of different expectations. Um, and it can get frustrating and it can get uh, confusing for a lot of us. And I would say that for the for the majority, uh, we have a culture that's very confused. <laughs> I mean, very con- there's a lot of confusion just on, for example, just on the whole term of racism and what is racism. I think that there's a ton of confusion on that. I think there's a ton of confusion on what is racism. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, I've experienced racism and they're not and they're non people of color. These are white folks. They're like, I experienced racism. You know, this black person called me a cracker. And it's like, no, that's not racism. What I'm talking about racism is I can't live in this part of town. You know, these schools can't get this funding because it's majority, you know, black. That's that's racism. That not someone calling you a name. That's discrimination or just plain hatred or whatever, maybe, you know, somebody calling you a cracker, that's not necessarily racism. What we're talking about is power. We're talking about power relationships based off of race and how people are classified in racial categories. So um, I think there's a lot of confusion on that. And and that's cross board, cross ethnicities. Um, I think there's a lot of black people that are extremely confused. And one of my goals is to lessen that confusion so that we all know what we're talking about when we're talking about racism. Um, a lot of people are confused on that. Some people are confused on what is race versus what is ethnicity. There's so much confusion around that. So much confusion, right? Um, there's been a very common notion that, you know, by 2050 in the United States that, you know, all black people or all people are going to be beige and we're just going to be one color. And that's not going to happen. I don't think that that's I think that that's kind of a kind of just a, a, a confusing notion that's been put out there that we're all going to be this you know interracial breed because if that was the case we would have already been that because we've all been in on this world i mean i don't think that that is necessarily going to happen will we have an increase in um interracial or dual heritage whatever term you want to use relationship sure absolutely we will and we're going to have you know a lot more people who have parents from two different ethnic groups but i don't think that that's going to mean that we're going to have this beige race of people. I think that that's just kind of a silly notion. And if we did, what, what, I don't think that that's going to change the power differential in the United States. It just won't. Nobody's going to give up power that way. I don't, you know, as we've seen various different examples, probably the most recent is South Africa. If you have a, just because you have a majority population of people doesn't mean that they can be in power, right? You know, that that's not how the strengths and numbers actually works. There's a lot of other things that go into it, economics, um, military force, and politics uh, go into that control, not just pure numbers in itself. 
And you can see that with the police. Um, there's definitely not more police officers and citizens. However, they have enough military force, enough economic force, and enough political force to continue to do the things that they do and not have any recourse. So do not think that if we have a beige majority um, of interracial people or biracial people or multiracial people, that that's going to change the power dynamic. That just absolutely is illogical and is a confusing talking point. So we got to be very careful on that. So back to culture, right? So as I said, my definition for culture is a set of beliefs, behaviors, concepts, linguistics, experiences, and expectations, which are subscribed to a social collective to meet a agreed upon wants and needs. Uh, it's very important to keep the following in mind in the context of my definition of culture. You know, there there can be a lot of overlap and similarities amongst cultures. You know, there must be more than one person to establish a culture. And yes, someone can practice more than one culture at a time. And I, and I think that's very important for us to understand. Like, you know, everybody is in relation to each other. We're social beings. So you can't just say that, you know, this person's an individual and this person does this individual thing. Well, not necessarily true. You know, if somebody chooses not to subscribe to what majority culture is doing, they're still in relation to that culture, but they're just rejecting some of those commonalities from that culture. Therefore, you know, they're still responding. So they may be, they may just be acting differently um, than the majority. However, they're still acting based off of what the majority has established or is doing. So, you know, I often feel that there are words and terms that are made more complex than they need to be. Which, which usually results in confusion. Culture does not have to be one of those words and terms. However, I do believe it must be understood to have people reach a full level of, um, of what I would consider to be genius or self-mastery um, um, or just awareness, to be woke. So uh, we have to understand what culture is, and we have to honestly have a, you know open conversation on what is black culture. You know, a lot of people think black culture is singing and dancing and soul food and how we, you know, wear our hairdos, males and females, um, you know, songs that we sing and, you know, uh, patterns that we do and all this other stuff. But, you know, that's part of it. But also we have to think what type of culture do we want to have? And my suggestion is that we need to have a culture of of uh, development, Yes, a culture of development. And what I mean by that is we don't have, we don't really, we have a culture based on survival. We have a culture based on pure survival. And I think that that's a traumatic response. And here's what I mean by pure survival. So let's use child rearing, for example. You know, it's very common in the black communities all across the United States that we have people in our families that we call aunties, uncles, brothers and sisters, cousins, even parents sometimes that are not related to us. These people may be just family friends. They may have just been neighbors that we've just known for a long time or whatever the case may be, but they're not actual blood relatives. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. However, we have to understand that that is a part of our culture that we had to adapt in order to survive and in order to take care of one another, where we we build these strong bonds and relationships with people in order to survive as a collective. That's not something that happens in all cultures. That does not happen in all cultures. We, we have that ingrained innate ability within us to build families around, you know, tra tragedies that have happened in order for people to develop, in order to for children to develop or, you know, families to develop to just keep moving forward. And some people I've seen some people link that to slavery and, and talking about just how there's so much transition amongst slaves um, that people just form families based off of, you know, who was there and who they can care for. But also, I think that that we've always kind of had this notion and we've kept this from generation to generation. And it has been a, tra a trauma response, you know, somebody in back in slavery days, someone's parent gets shipped off to another plantation or murdered or whatever the case may be, or they just die. Um, 
and then someone steps up and and, and take care you know, or not just someone, but maybe a group of people to come, you know, step up and take care of this child. And they treat this child as if it was their own. You know, there are also breeding farms on plantations that people often don't talk about. You know, for example, um, people seeing the movie Django Unchained, uh, people, you know, if you go back and watch that movie and you look at the plantation on the movie, the plantation was called Candyland. And the one where um, Brad Pitt's character Oh, not like that wasn't Brad Pitt. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character um, was the slave master of. There's no cotton on that plantation. No cotton at all. That was a breeding plantation, uh, and that's why it's called Candyland. There was a lot of metaphorical things to kind of hint at that. But um, you know, we had we had these breeding farms where people were there to mate and been and treated like animals uh, to just breed. And how do you build families when you're just breeding, when you're breeding like horses, when you're breeding like dogs, um, and you're just, you know, g- genetically just being manipulated. It's very difficult to build families around that. It's very, very difficult to build families around that when you've been treated literally like an animal. It's hard to build a family when you're being treated like an animal. And unfortunately, a lot of those habits and cultural customs have um, manifested themselves generation after generation to what we see now where we have, you know, over 70% of, you know, black children born out of wedlock and things like that. I mean, it's, it's just the, the numbers and the stories that to accompany those numbers are just like, it's terrifying, but it's become normalized. It's become normalized. And I think that that's a scary part of what's happening within our culture, right? Mm -hmm is that we have significant um, dysfunction happening with our family units. And that's one of those things within our culture that we definitely need to work on. Uh, To accompany that, another thing in our culture that we definitely need to work on is our, um, what I would consider to be our male and female relationships. And this is in the area of dating and just in general. Like we have, we're very poor in relating to each other on a gender basis. Um, uh, it's, I mean, I think we have issues across the board <laughs> and relating to each other, but especially when it comes to black males, black females relating to each other, there's a lot of trauma, um, infused all up in there. And to evidence, you know, to further evidence this point, uh, you can go to YouTube and just type in gender war and you're going to see a bunch of black folks talking bad about each other, um, because of the traumatic past that we've had. And it's frustrating, man. You get it's frustrating because you have people who really become very popular on social media, um, because of this. And it's just negativity over and over and over. And people just feed on this, and we just continue to rip each other apart. And we have you know specials on. There's no good black men, and you know black men ain't this. And then we talking about black females are Negro bedwinches, and <laughs> it's like it just gets ridiculous after a while. It gets ridiculous. And that's one of the pain points that we have within our culture is that our male and female relationships are not up to par at all. So our relationships are, you know, all over the place. Um, and that and that seeps into, you know, how we relate to each other, how we parent our children and how we interact and trust one another within our culture. There's a lot of mistrust um, amongst black people. You know, one of the uh, I like to do social experiments and I just like to ask people questions just to fill out people and figure out what's kind of what what's happening. Um, and, and I think you should do this, too. And especially with a lot of teenagers, I always ask them, like, who do you trust? And most people that I know, they don't trust anybody. Most of the black teenagers that I come across, they don't trust anybody. They don't trust anybody. Some of them don't even trust themselves, but. When you don't trust anybody, how do you have a community and you don't have any trust? How do you have a culture that's based off of no trust? When you don't have any trust. Now, granted, in order to have trust, you have to do things to um, solidify that with people. You can't just trust everybody because then you can get manipulated. We do live in a harsh world. We need to be honest about that. But we, I meet so many people that just don't trust anyone. And I'm like, man, how do you have a culture where you don't trust anyone? How do you build anything? How do you build a relationship with somebody if you halfway trust them? It makes things very complicated. And this is what we're working with. And my 
my viewpoint is a lot of this is based off the trauma that we've experienced, right? You know, so our culture, we have a lot of things to work on. We have to be objective when we're talking about culture and black culture is what is this? Is this really working for us? You know, and we can't, I mean, at this point, I feel like it's not really worth blaming who, how do we get this way and who to blame? I hear a lot of conversation about blaming elders and the civil rights generation failed us and, or just based on racism, and white supremacy. I think that it has a lot to do with all of it. So now that we know that it's all screwed up, instead of focusing a lot of energy on blaming, you know, f- trying to figure out where the blame should lie, we should really figure out how do we change this. And we, and we had to do it quickly. Um, cause it, it's really bad for a lot of us. It's really bad for a lot of us. Um, you know, another part of our culture that we don't talk about enough is how our culture gets capitalized by everybody but us. Everybody capitalizes on black culture. I actually think that to this point, we've been conditioned, we've been socially engineered to continue to operate in the culture that we have so other people can um, capitalize and so other people can succeed. Now, I talked about this on a previous podcast about um, Grant Cardone, and I ain't going to just pick on him, but he's really good at capitalizing on black culture um, to push entrepreneurship. And I've seen this with various other people, too. It ain't just him. But he's very good at that. And and we can talk about black music, talk about hip hop, we get hell, even R and B now, if we even have that. We can talk about pop culture and how um how that's been capitalized off of us as well and how you can have people like Adele and Sam Smith and Iggy Azalea and um all these white folks that come in, Justin Timberlake, all these folks that come in and just like, boom, they blow up with what we've created versus if a Fantasia sung the song or, uh, or someone else, uh, it might not be received the same. Now that's what happens when we don't have an intact culture. Other people come pick off of that. Um, and they'll push it forward for their own gains. So we don't do that very well. We don't come out of we don't, um, commodernize our culture very well. Um, and, you know, culture is an intellectual system, which is developed to protect a group's survival. You know, this is what culture is at its core function. It is not merely dancing, music, and food. So even though it's not just those things, it's also utilized by other people and people capitalize on it. You know, and and and, and it's very frustrating because, you know, I want black people to be successful. I want black people to have joy. I want to see black people building Silicon Valleys and where they're at and, you know, all these different hubs. And I want to see us doing it, but we're not in these places because our culture is really dysfunctional at the moment, you know? And, and I believe that we really have a culture that's been based off of the trauma that we've experienced, you know, from the foods that we eat, the ways that we communicate with each other, the songs that we sing, you know, um, the way we have sex. I think that that's traumatic. Um, the way we build relationships, how we rear our children, what we dress, where we live, how we live, all these things have a traumatic response. So in essence, we could say black culture is a culture based off a of trauma, right? It's based off of us being dominated as a collective disenfranchised as a collective and subjugated as a collective. Now, those are some big words that really feel very harsh, but we have to be honest. Like this is what, this is where we're at. Now there are some, that doesn't mean that there aren't any good things within black culture. There definitely is. But if we're to look at us as a collective, we are struggling. We are struggling. You know, you know, all this trauma involves some level of disassociation. Um, You know, we're, we're so disassociated from each other that it's very hard for us to build and have a culture of success and development because we're always putting out these, you know, these, these traumas. We're always moving. We're always on go. Um, and that, and that stress and that toxic stress is really, um, us just trying to survive. And when we're always in survival mode and we're not really at a point where we can move forward and we can develop, um, we end up being stuck and some people regress. Some people regress. Um, a lot of times we believe that time is supposed to 
automatically bring in progression, but people regress in time as well. And, you know, in certain areas, I would say that black people, we have regressed significantly um, over the last 50 years or so. We've had significant regression. Um, in some areas, we have done better, but collectively, I don't think that we are in better shape than we were 50 years ago. And we have to be honest about that. We can't use, you know, individual successes as collective representation because that's not necessarily true. The collective of us is hurting. Now, granted, the whole United States is in a pain of hurt. You know, we have debt out of this world. We have people struggling all over this world. But at the same time, why do we have to be the last rung? Why do we have to be the bottom of the totem pole? Why do we have to be the bottom of the barrel? Why does it have to be us? And a lot of it, I believe, deals with us shifting our culture. So we, we gotta have, we just gotta have a better understanding of the type of culture that we have and how do we move this culture forward. Um, because you know, people, there is a vested interest in us not moving, moving where we are, because we're so we benefit so many different industries based off of our dysfunction. It goes beyond the military industrial complex and it goes beyond entertainment. Um, it's it's a lot of different things. And if we stay dysfunctional, you know, this uh, this country operates on our dysfunction. And we don't see that this country literally operates off of our dysfunction. You know, one of the things that I do in some of the training, whenever I'm training with uh, social service per, uh, providers, I talk about, you know, a lot of times I talk about the prison industrial complex. But that feeds so many different industries, right? So if you lock up a bunch of black people, you know, then if they have children, those children go to adoption, they go to foster care, that feeds social workers, that feeds nonprofit organizations, um, which feeds philanthropy, uh, <laughs> which, you know, also feeds jails. And, you know, all these people eat off that dysfunction. And, those di and all that dysfunction has significant ramifications on how we develop our communities and our culture and if all black people if we were just like we had a you know a huge memo been sent over all the black channels and every black person got this memo that said all right we're gonna shift we're gonna just we're not doing anything we're never gonna get arrested again we're never gonna um do anything that can be utilized against us and criminal and we can be criminalized for we would disrupt a lot of things think about who makes you know the betting clothing for jails the telephone companies that profit off of jails like we would we would disrupt so many different industries we would literally shake up the economy within this country by shifting our culture and it's i mean it's crazy juvenile justice centers will go down a lot of people's political bills would fall through because they're attaching attaching them to all these dysfunctional things that are happening um so it's, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot. But we have to have an honest conversation about culture. And I wanted to just bring this to light now because this is something I'm going to keep touching on. And um, I just wanted people to kind of get their brain wheels turning around this whole concept of culture. Because, you know, right now, I don't think that we have a culture that's really working for us very well. I think we have a very um, confusing and dysfunctional culture collectively no matter what our like i said no matter what our social economic status is no matter what our gender is our sexuality as a collective we are in a bad place due to our culture we have to make some shifts and i'm and like i said we got to be honest and i like to be honest and keep things honest i don't think that we're all going to shift our culture i think some of us are so far gone and we're so conditioned and normalized to a lot of what's happening that we're going to stay stuck there but I think that for those of us that are seeking some change and those of us that do want to do, do some blah, <laughs> do want to do <laughs> some things a little bit differently and push and push things forward, we can. So, you know, you know, right now I've been hearing a lot doing it for the culture. You know, we want to push the culture forward. I love that talk, but let's be honest. What are we talking about? Where, where are we pushing this culture to? What is this culture? And if we can't answer those questions. And we're really just making new slogans that sound good and feel good for us in the moment. So don't get caught in the slogans. Um, be sure to be objective. Be sure to be critical and analyze things and ask, you know, you know, good strategic questions on, you know, what culture are we trying to push forward? And is this the culture that we want? I'm going to talk more, a lot more about this in future podcasts. I want to just drop this, get people's brain wheels turning a little bit. Feel free to hit me up. 
uh, at you can hit me up at the woke podcast on Twitter. Um, you can check out the site www.wokepodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook. Um, if you hit us up on Twitter, use the hashtag woke. It's hashtag woke or hashtag stay woke. Um, and let's have some conversations. Hit me up. And I hope everybody's doing well. Please remember, be constructive, be safe, be woke, be woke, be woke. Peace.